Macro photography in the natural world is hugely popular, both for aesthetic images and for scientific study. And one of the best ways of showing the subject is in a studio environment with flash, which gives you the option to capture every minute detail. It's not without its drawbacks though, as from an ecological sense, the first priority of all nature photography should be to minimize any disturbance or distress to our subjects. And digging up or cutting plants and dragging creatures from their natural ecosystem is something best avoided unless very carefully managed. One solution is to take the studio to the field, which is what we'll be looking at today. Going out into the field to photograph your subjects with a load of studio gear may sound tricky and prohibitively expensive, but in fact, you can start this process without a massive financial outlay. I'll be clear, you will need some basic essentials to get you started. But first, a very quick rundown of how this studio set looks out in the field, just to give you an overview. You have a subject with a white background, preferably backlit. You then have a second light firing through some form of diffusion as close as your framing will permit. So you get a nice, soft, diffused light rendering the details without harsh shadows. That's the general gist, and to achieve this, you will need one, a camera with decent close focus capabilities, the ability to shoot in manual, and the means of triggering a flash gun. Ideally, a dedicated macro lens of at least 90 to 100 mm focal length on a DSLR or CSC is going to be perfect, as these tend to give you a full one-to-one -one magnification at a decent working distance, so you can photograph without having to be right on top of the subject and giving yourself the headaches of casting shadows or spooking a jumpy subject. As a low-cost alternative to the macro lens, if you already have a moderate telephoto like a 55 to 200, for example, you can pair this with your extension tubes to get your maximum focus shorter. You won't get to your one-to-one -one magnification, but it will allow you to get closer than you otherwise would, so you can get the subject larger in the frame. Number two, flash guns, plural. There's a lot you can do in photography with just one speed light, but this method is going to call for two of them as a minimum, and it's essential that at least one of them, but ideally both, can be fired in manual, so you can control the exposure consistently. One is acting as your background, or your backlight, and the other is filling in detail from the front. Both need to be able to be triggered off camera, so either units that can be triggered optically via your camera's flash or by radio trigger are great. Cable triggering does work, but it's potentially tricky and impractical out in the field. Remember, we don't strictly need complex TTL flashes, so cheap second-hand units work fine, as long as they can work in manual. Number three, some kind of white translucent diffusing material that you can shoot through to give you a clean white background and another similar piece for softening your fill flash to avoid hard shadows. If you don't have any diffusing material to hand, you can get away with using a white reflective surface instead, but you'll probably have to use higher power levels on your flashes for the same exposure, so you're gonna be draining those batteries quicker. You also need to work much harder with reflectors to position your flashes and get the best lighting angles. The other key ingredient is some kind of way of holding all of this stuff in the right position, and the positioning is really important. If you have someone willing to come along with you on a jolly into the countryside and help you out, you can actually work very inexpensively and reasonably quickly to shoot a variety of subjects, but it does require a steady hand and good attention to detail from your able assistant. Without a companion or for more consistent control, you're going to need some other means of holding your lights, diffusion material, and possibly even the subject in the shot. So let's look at this next. Tripods are really useful, particularly those with adjustable angles for their legs and center columns. You can also use light stands, but out in the field, they tend to struggle on uneven ground because of the spreaders. You basically need the means of positioning your flashes and your diffusers in the right place. So if you can get hold of clamps and bendy goosenecks or variable friction arms like these Manfrotto ones we're using today, they allow you to set everything up and hold your gear in what is likely to be an awkward and compromising position. You don't strictly need a tripod for the camera as you're shooting with flash, which will freeze the subject anyway. And some prefer to work freehand with the camera as it's often just quicker to step in and get the shot. But if you really want to take the time with the subject, perhaps one where you're struggling with the focus, then a tripod for the camera allows for much more precision, which is the camp I sit in. So there's your basics. It's a workable solution that with practice and patience can give you some great images. As you may imagine though, managing four or five components in outdoor conditions where you may only have a small window in the weather is not the smoothest way to guarantee you're gonna get the shot. So there are significant changes you can make to the basic loadout that will make life easier. Spending more is not necessarily going to give you better finished images, just the convenience of a quicker and easier setup, which, if you're doing this commercially, will likely pay for itself several times over. First step is to swap out the rear backlight for a decently deep softbox. You use the diffuser fabric as your backlight, and because the light's in a softbox, you minimise your light spill and make the light more efficient. 
Better battery life is always a nice bonus, but you also gain by only having to support one piece of gear. You want to avoid too shallow a softbox here if possible. Especially with speed lights, you're likely to find it gives you a hot spot in the center and darker corners. And you really want an evenly lit background, especially if you're gonna be adding multiple subjects to the same image in post-production. If you have a second softbox for your fill flash, the same thing applies. One fewer element blowing around in the wind, one fewer support mechanism that you have to carry and manipulate. You may even consider going straight in with softboxes rather than investing in the diffusers, friction arms and clamps, especially if you've got other flash photography ambitions anyway. The other primary way you can improve consistency out in the field is with the light you're feeding those softboxes. And the high power battery operated studio heads like the Photix Indra, the Elenchrom ELB and the Profoto B2 allow for many more flashes and ready-made softbox fittings. Generally, you'll get more consistent lighting across the backlight because of how the flash tube is oriented. So you spend more time taking pictures and less servicing the gear and refining your exposure. If you're looking to add this kind of technique to your professional arsenal, these can be a worthy expenditure. So there's your theory. In the next video, I'll be putting this into practice and showing you how you can apply this to photograph different types of subjects with tips on basic exposure starting points and such. I hope you found this useful. Don't forget to check out part two. And for more tips on macro photography, head on over to wexphonographic.com.